Welcome to uh, Equality Debate. Um, Equality Debates, which are regular series uh, events organized by the World Inequality Lab to present social science book and discuss with their authors and hopefully stimulate public debate. So the World Inequality Lab is a global research um, lab, uh, lab <laughs> focused on the study of inequality worldwide. And it's very important to us not only to produce research on equality in collaboration with institutions and researchers across the world, but also to ensure that the results are disseminated widely and inform policy and stimulate public debate. So it's really great to have so many of you joining. I see about like 60 people already connected. So please don't hesitate to write your name and introduce yourself in the chat. Maybe tell us uh, where you're from, where you are now. It's always useful to know. My name is Alice Povel. I'm a communications manager at the World Inequality Lab. So I'm based in Paris with Thomas Piketty, co-director of the World Inequality Lab, who is also on screen with us. And uh, with us today, we also have Lucas Chancel, also co-director of the World Inequality Lab and visiting associate professor at the Harvard Kennedy School this year. And on that same side of the world, we're delighted to have with us Darren Asimoglu. So thanks again for joining us. And um, so before I hand over to Thomas Piketty, um, just a few words about how we're planning to run this event and how it will be structured. So we'll be together for about an hour. And we'll first have a presentation from Darren Asimoglu, and then about half an hour for questions. So uh, please don't hesitate as our speakers are talking to react in the chat and ask your questions in the Q&A tool. So we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the event. And so that then during the Q&A session, we'll be able to direct the questions uh, to Darren Asimoglu. So um, now I'll hand over to Thomas Piketty for him to introduce our guest and the book that we'll be looking at today. Thanks a lot, uh, Alice. Well, I, I don't think uh, Darren really needs to be uh, introduced, but let me simply say that I am personally very, very happy that we have Darren with us today. Uh, Darren, I think, you know, we are in 2023. We were hired together at MIT as assistant professors in 1993, which is 30 years ago. You know, I cannot believe that we were already <laughs> there. Uh, you and me, we were very young and energetic at the time. I mean, we're still young and trying to do uh, good uh, research and write books. Uh, but, you know, I, yeah, I cannot believe it's been so long. And, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that to, to hear you today about uh, this new book, so Power and Progress. So that's really in the continuation. So you wrote uh, Why Nations Fail with Jim Robinson, I guess, 10 years ago or by 2012, so a little more than 10 years ago. And then The Narrow Corridor in 2019. And so this is really in the continuation. Uh, I have noticed uh, at the at the you know the end chapters of the book that you are uh, almost recommending progressive wealth tax for the future. So you are getting uh, you know we are getting closer <laughs> together. That's good. But you know of course there's still a lot of uh, you know different views, different approach, and that's good. That's exactly what we need. So we are very happy to to talk about your new book today. The floor is yours, and and we'll have a discussion afterwards. Thanks a lot, Darren. Thank you, Toma. Thank you, Alice. And thank you, Luca. It's a true pleasure to be here. You know, uh, I have actually known Toma for more than 30 years because we were also sort of PhD students together at the LSC, uh, although he was, a you know, associated both with the LSC and, uh, uh, and, and, and Paris, the Delta, I guess, at the time, Paris, but became Paris School of Economics. So uh, energetic and naive, I think, 30 years ago would be a better description of myself, but I think Toma was already wise. So, uh, but it is a true pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you uh, about Power and Progress, uh, my new book uh, with uh, Simon Johnson. And uh, what is, uh, what makes it really uh, sort of very relevant for me to talk about this is because I think uh, the issues are very close to those studied by many people in the world in inequality lab, uh, you know, including Luca, 
and Thomas and Alice and uh, uh, and I'm really looking forward to their feedback because I think there are a lot of complementarities in our approaches, but also some differences. So I'm looking forward to getting feedback and learning because this is not the end of the road for me. My views on this topic are continuing to evolve and perhaps I may get closer to Tama or not, we'll see. Uh, so power and progress, our thousand year struggle over technology and prosperity. And we wrote the book uh, partly because we are motivated by uh, the way that we have come to think about new technologies and perhaps some of the shortcomings of the approach of both economists and policymakers, especially on this side of the Atlantic, to new technology. And the key to our starting point is that we've come to believe that there is too much optimism about technological change ultimately bringing benefits for everybody without worrying about who controls technology, who controls information, and how technology is being developed and used. And this is so much the case that, in some sense, in economics, there is a very deeply held view that technological progress is going to benefit workers as well as other people. And this view, which is in economic growth courses, basic micro and macro courses at the undergraduate and graduate levels, doesn't even have a name. So Simon and I had to christen it, and we call it the productivity bandwagon. So it goes something like this. Technology improves, so our capabilities improve. And once our capabilities improve, we do more with the resources that we have. So productivity, say average productivity of labor, increases. And from there on, there are a number of economic forces that lead to workers also benefiting, meaning, for example, wages for across demographic groups or at least average wages increase. And that's really a very critical step towards uh shared prosperity because the majority of the population in any country, especially in the industrialized nations, uh, earn their living as, 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 as in the labor market. But this step from productivity increasing to workers also benefiting is actually not immediate. And it, it is based on two important set of assumptions that are often left implicit. One is institutional related to power. The other one is related to the nature of technology. So let me start first with the institutional one, which is that productivity increases, firms therefore want more labor, and they are going to go and compete for more labor in the labor market, and that's going to push up wages. So that's the standard story. But this understates the role that labor market institutions play. So if labor market institutions don't provide enough voice or power to workers, even as labor demand increases, they may not benefit. Or worse, for example, if we are in a coercive labor market, uh, when work, when firms want more labor, they may actually try to get that via coercion. And that is actually one of the very critical channels via which the productivity bandwagon or may or may not work. If you're a big believer in the productivity bandwagon, you can go in history and find many examples in which productivity increases and those are reflected at least in part to workers. But you can also find very uh, key technologies that do not do uh, any type of uh, benefits for, for workers. So here I show two of them, which illustrate first the uh, uh, this, this power issue or the institutional issue. On the left, I have uh, one of the more important technologies of the medieval age, the uh, uh, windmills. It's not the only technological breakthroughs of the medieval age. There were many important advances in the organization of production, new crops, new ways of uh, uh, organizing agricultural out, uh, uh, production, but windmills hold a special place because they really improved productivity across a number of tasks by several fold. But if you look at the data, you don't see any benefits for workers. And when you look into it, it's quite clear windmills were completely monopolized by the elite. Aristocracy and the clergy were the main owners of the windmills. And uh, of course, the medieval labor markets were anything but competitive. In fact, so much so that not just workers were tied to their land, they were often forced to use the windmills that uh, uh, that that the clergy or the aristocracy were 
were operating rather than being able to use their own hand mills or set up their own collective windmills. So in an environment like that, of course, you shouldn't expect the productivity bandwagon to work, and it didn't. On the right, there's an even more striking case, Eli Whitney's cotton gin from 1794. This may not have been the first cotton gin. Cotton gin has many owners in terms of its intellectual uh, pedigree, but these effects are very clear. It turned the U.S. South from an economic backwater to the engine of the world economy in the first half of the 19th century, fueling the Industrial Revolution by providing cotton, being, being the biggest exporter of cotton. That's all thanks to the uh, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, because it wasn't impossible to grow and clean cotton before then in the South. And, uh, and huge fortunes were made out of it. But what happened to the workers who actually produced cotton? Uh, all the evidence we have suggests that their conditions actually worsened because these were the enslaved people and they were moved down south. The coercion worsened, working hours worsened, and working conditions worsened. Again, the power imbalance meant that it wasn't automatic that productivity increases were going to translate into benefits for workers. But even more uh, sort of important to my thinking and to Simon's thinking is the nature of technology. And there, uh, it might be best to il illustrate this with the technological transition that's often credited with all of the comfort and prosperity that we have today, the Industrial Revolution, and we tend to hear a very rosy picture of the Industrial Revolution. But actually, Industrial Revolution was not a, uh, a very sort of happy uh, uh, prosperity generating process, at least for the first 100 years. The real incomes of working people in England stagnated, may have declined. Their working hours increased by as much as 20%. Their autonomy was completely lost as they were moved into the modern factory where working conditions were pretty horrible. And of course, health conditions worsened significantly as well as they moved into the cities where uh, pollution and uh, uncontrolled epidemics were rampant. This was a very important part of the story, again, related to social and political issues, but also at the center of the Industrial Revolution was the type of technological change. And the key technological changes of the era centered on automation, meaning the substitution of machinery for tasks previously performed by workers. This is the reason why spinners were first uh, thrown out of their job. Even more importantly, what you're seeing here is weaving factories. Weaving used to be a very high wage occupation, and uh, if you look at average weaver wages in the in the in during uh, during this period in England, it falls by about 30, 40 percent, and that's because machinery in, installed in factories automated and took away many of the tasks that workers used to perform, and there were no new tasks for workers, so there wasn't any big push for increase in, inefficient, in, in increase in labor demand. So what's going on here is that even the presumption that here, as productivity rises, firms will have a reason for hiring more labor is not warranted. So the idea that higher average productivity leads to greater labor demand is actually something that uh, is not implied by basic economics. In basic economics, labor demand is related to the marginal product of labor, and marginal product and average product don't need to co-move together. It's only in some simple models, because of assumptions that we make, that we then perhaps project onto reality, that we think that average product and uh, marginal product should move together. If productivity increases, but marginal productivity doesn't rise, firms don't even actually want to hire more labor, and wages can fall rather than decline. So why would it that would be the case that average productivity increases and marginal productivity declines? Well, that's what automation is about. You make labor less necessary for production. If you want to understand that, it's perhaps even more clearly, it's perhaps easiest to think of this often quoted uh, story about the future of the factor, modern factory. It's said that the future factory will have two employees, a man and a dog, the man is there to feed the dog and the dog is there to make sure that the man doesn't touch the equipment. Okay, that might be your utopia if you're a manager or it might be your dystopia, uh, but uh, whatever it is, it makes it clear that you can have huge average productivity, but no marginal productivity or very low marginal productivity of workers. If the equipment gets better and productivity of this factory increases, 
that's going to mean higher average productivity, still one employee or perhaps two if you count the dog. But the humor of the story is that, of course, that employee is not very relevant, doesn't contribute much to production, and factories are not going to rush to hire more men and their dog. So in a world like that, productivity increases are decoupled from the desire of firms to hire more labor or to want to compensate labor. And that's exactly what happened during the British Industrial Revolution. And of course, all of this is again embedded in institutions and uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 who has political power. The same things that led to intense uh, monitoring, intense discipline in the factories. The same things that kept the cities uh, so unhealthy for people were also the conditions that enabled firms to double down on automation, despite the fact that this was generating. Uh, huge profits for firms, but no benefits for workers. So again, we have to think about all of these institutional aspects, which I'm going to come back to. Now, of course, you might think modern times are different. After all, what I described about the British Industrial Revolution was true for the first phase. And from around 1850, things started getting a little better. Wages started increasing. Cities were cleaned up. Working hours declined. Uh, and I'll talk about what why that was in a second. But I want to first point out using U.S. data that modern times are different and they're not completely different. So here I'm showing from uh, one data source the evolution of the real earnings. Oh, oh, sorry, so these are the real wages. So real wages of 10 demographic groups distinguished by gender, men and women, and education going all the way from orange uh, workers with less than a high school degree, high school degree in green, and then workers with more than a college degree, postgraduate degree in dark blue, workers with uh, just a college degree are in light blue. And here from 1963 to about uh, the mid-late 70s, you see the period of shared prosperity. All of these 10 curves are growing in tandem. This is They are all normalized to zero, and this is the cumulative increase. The fact that all of these curves are parallel means that they're growing more or less at the same rate. And this was also true even more so in the 1950s. This is the period in which productivity growth is essentially the same fast rate as the real wage growth, around 2.5% a year. But then you also see that this period of shared prosperity comes to an abrupt end sometime around the late 1970s, early 1980s. Inequality is increasing quite strikingly in the labor market, but even more jarring is the fact that real incomes of low education and even mid-education groups uh, are declining quite sharply for men and to some extent also for women. So this therefore shows in the United States both the way in which the modern times were different, this remarkable period of shared prosperity and how it came to an end. This is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Inequality has increased in many industrialized nations, but the May basic contours of it are very U.S. idiosyncratic. So uh, except for Germany, there are no other countries where you see this sort of declines in low wage uh, earnings while inequality is increasing. And in some places, labor market inequality has remained more stable, such as Sweden and, uh, and France. But overall, inequality is rising in many other countries as well. So this is not just a U.S. specific phenomenon. So then it's useful to go back and Think about what was it that made the productivity bond wagon work, perhaps starting around 1850, certainly in the decades that followed World War II. And it relates to these two preconditions of shared prosperity that I mentioned earlier. And there is no best, better place to understand this than the U.S. auto industry at the beginning of the 20th century. The U.S. auto industry was a leader in the application of electrical machinery, introduction of inter interchangeable part system, and, uh, and mass production. So there was a quite a high degree of automation. But critically, it wasn't just automation. Together with automation, there were a whole host of new tasks that were being introduced. And you see here in the, the in the Rouge plant of Henry Ford, all of these workers that are actually in, in, engaged in critical tasks. They're doing assembly, they're doing painting and welding. They're also doing a lot of technical troubleshooting, inspection, quality control, and so on. And it was these new tasks combined with new tasks in clerical functions, both in manufacturing and outside manufacturing, that was responsible for remarkable 
wage and employment growth in the auto industry and the U.S. economy as a whole. So the key, therefore, is that as well as automation, new technologies were used for things that increase marginal per worker productivity or in more pro-worker ways. And this was coupled with uh, a better balance of power. This was also the period and the auto industry was at the forefront of labor organization. This is a picture from the United Auto Workers sit-down strike of 1937 against General Motors, but this was sort of the period in which many other industries were also unionizing. Unions uh, were at the forefront of uh, negotiating for better working conditions and higher wages, and they also influenced uh, training and how technology was used. And it was also these same forces, together with a very rapid democratization, that were at the root of uh, the second half of the British Industrial Revolution being so different than the first half. In Britain, technological changes, direction changed. Uh, trade unions became legalized and the, uh, the you know, first adult male suffrage, then uh, adult full suffrage was established in the, in the UK. So all of these institutional changes were very important. Now, why did things go wrong in the digital age? Well, one part of it is this uh, is, is summarized by this factory. This is a modern car factory. You see, again, advanced machinery. But what's different is that you don't see the people, the workers, performing key tasks. There's only one gentleman there, and he doesn't seem like he's doing anything that important. But perhaps he did do the design of these machines, or he may do some sort of maintenance later. So too much focus on automation and not enough on creating new tasks. So technological change, rather than being balanced between new tasks and automation, became much less pro-worker. But uh, this may not be what you are generally sort of uh, used to in terms of inequality in the United States. So let me just show one chart from my work with Pascual Restrepo, which is sort of looking at the data from a slightly different angle than the one I showed you in those earlier charts, but also trying to illustrate the role of automation. What I'm doing here is I'm looking at uh, more detailed demographic groups rather than just uh, gender and education. So it's these each one of these circles is a demographic group distinguished by gender, education, age, and ethnicity. You can see from the color coding there, uh, which ones are which education group. On the vertical axis, I'm zeroing in on the period of uh, the rise in inequality. So this is the change in hourly, cumulative change in hourly wage from 1980 to 2016, 2017. You can see that the same pattern as I highlighted in the previous picture is there. This is the zero point here. So many of these circles, especially many of the big ones, large demographic groups are below the zero. Those are the groups that have lost out in terms of income. And as you can see, it includes many high school education and high school dropout groups, as well as some with associate degrees, two-year degrees. But the most important change or the new thing is the horizontal axis, where uh, I have plotted Pascual and my measure of automation impacting a particular demographic group. Roughly speaking, this is the fraction of tasks that that demographic group used to perform in 1980 that have since been uh, automation uh, automated. So 25% here means that this demographic group has lost about 25% of the tasks that they used to perform. And you can see that there is a very strong relationship. This is conditional or unconditional, doesn't matter. And about 50 to 70% of the overall increase in between group inequality is explained by this automation-driven factor. Automation is not an exogenous technological tsunami affecting people. It's a choice that firms are making, and it's embedded in an institution just like as it was in the British Industrial Revolution, but it is one of the major channels for U.S. wage inequality. And it is in one of the major channels precisely because automation has been the main focus of companies. Why has it been the main focus of companies? That's where power and institutions come in. It was both a change in corporate visions, meaning what are the priorities of bosses, and it was also the institutional guardrails that were lifted. So this is the pro professional air traffic controller strike, which was ended by Ronald Reagan firing all of the striking workers, which was a turning point, one of the turning points in uh, American labor movement. After that, firms themselves, private firms, took a much harder line on, on striking workers. And this was one of the contexts which determined how the priorities of firms shifted. 
uh, we shouldn't just blame Milton Friedman, but he was one of the emblematic figures arguing that you know firms should be focused only on delivering better returns for shareholders. Social responsibility of businesses to increase its profits was the saying uh, that Milton Friedman popularized in a New York Times Magazine article in 1970. And what that meant in particular was it was good for managers to cut wages, and it was doubly good for managers to introduce automation to cut labor costs as a whole, because both of these delivered higher returns to their shareholders. Now, this is the age of AI, so you may be particularly worried that AI is going to be uh, a further factor increasing the same tensions as I've shown you and lead to even more inequality, lead to even more non-shared prosperity, even more huge fortunes at the very top. And I think that is exactly the path that we are going, but I want to make a slightly more nuanced argument. And the argument is that actually AI, especially generative AI, could be used in a pro-worker direction. What is so distinctive about generative AI, and it's uh, it's all hype to some degree, but there is also some impressive core, which is that it can take a very, very large amount of information, recognize a context, and then uh, provide in a curated form the right relevant information for that context. So if you are an electrician, you're trying to solve some new problems that you have encountered in the electricity grid, good luck to you because you have not been trained for this. It's a very difficult problem. Unless you are the very, very best electrician, perhaps it's going to be hopeless. But with the right generative AI tools, you can immediately learn from the accumulated knowledge of similar cases. So if that's the case, then a generative AI could actually be a pro-worker tool contributing to the new tasks in exactly the way that I described, for example, the Ford Motor Factories did or the decades after World War II did. In fact, this is not a uh, just a fanciful thought of mine. There are already a few, uh, few papers that provide a proof of concept illustration of this from programming, from simple writing tasks, and from uh, work uh, uh, customer service. In all of these cases, it's not clear that these can be scaled up. But the interesting thing is that the... Uh, for example, in the case of writing tasks that comes from Shuket Noi and Whitney Zhang, two of our students here at MIT, shows that the improvements are both in terms of time taken to write the tasks, uh, to complete the tasks, and in the quality, and it comes from shifting the distribution uh, in a way that benefits especially middle skill or low skill or low expertise workers. Now, the question is whether this will happen, and uh, and unfortunately, my view is that it is unlikely to happen along our current path. And part of the reason is actually very related to why it is that we have used the digital technologies in, incorrectly. And it again relates to the vision of the powerful actors. This was that vision that led to mechanization in a way that wasn't beneficial for workers or the factory system during the British Industrial Revolution. And it was that vision in the same of the, in the case, case of the corporate bosses that I highlighted earlier on, but this is all underpinned by a particular vision of how AI should be used that goes back to Alan Turing or to the fee, to the to the conference where the uh, topic, uh, the, the, the field of artificial intelligence was christened in 1956. And it is that machines should be designed and can be designed to be smarter and more powerful than most humans. This is the vision of autonomous machine intelligence. And this vision inexorably leads to a bias towards automation because if machines are so powerful and autonomous, then they should, of course, perform tasks and they can perform tasks better than humans. The alternative is what we call machine usefulness, which goes back to uh, this gentleman, Norman Wiener at MIT, but many other people sort of picked it up both as a philosophical matter and as a practical matter. And it was already... Uh, something that was delivering a lot of beneficial results in the 50s, 60s, and throughout the later decades, where you would actually develop tools that would be useful to humans. This is what led to the computer mouse, hyperlink, hypertext, uh, menu-driven uh, computers, and so on. And uh, But its limitations was that this wasn't where the industry went. And of course, there were also only a few things that you could do in this pro-human vision, with the old style computer. So that's where the generative AI comes in. Let me actually make two more points and then I will conclude. The problem is that in fact, it's not just that 
the wrong way to use AI is going to lead to unshared gains. There's also a lot of evidence mounting up, mounting, mounting, accumulating that the way that we're using digital technologies is not even delivering productivity. And that's partly because, uh, because of the vision. Because if you are so focused on autonomous machine intelligence, what you're going to do both on the, at the corporate end and the tech end is that you're going to put a huge emphasis on automation, which means automating a lot of things that humans are actually not that bad at. So when you do that, you're not going to get a lot of productivity growth. We're seeing that in self-checkout kiosks. We're seeing that in uh, customer service systems that are automated and also in factories where automation has not always delivered the productivity gains that uh, people were hoping for. And all of this is, of course, bracketed by political changes. AI is an information tool, and it potentially centralizes information. It may centralize it in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, which can use it for political control. It may centralize it in the hands of digital platforms, which may use it for different ways of monetizing that information. But I think centralized control is ultimately inimical to true democracy. And if democracy and inequality or or weakening of democracy and inequality go hand in hand, that's actually much harder to, to, to reverse. Finally, uh, you know, in the book, we also have uh, a, a policy discussion. I'm not gonna go into it, but I think the key is that if this diagnosis is correct, government policy and civil society policy have to play a central role in redirecting technological change. And that has to start by changing the narrative away from uh, just elite control of these technologies, which is where the vision problems become worse, towards more democratic control of these technologies. Uh, and we have seen different ways of doing that in the past through labor organizations, civil society organization, government regulation. And, uh, and, and I think the purpose of all of this in this instance has to be really on redirecting technological change. And I think redirecting technological change is something that we have seen successfully in some instances, for example, in the, in the area of energy, uh, even though it's not like the first instinct of many economists and some poly commentators that, you know, technology cannot be influenced by civil society or government action, I think it becomes it's becoming more and more important in the age of AI to ensure both better productivity growth and shared prosperity. Thank you. I'll stop here and I'm looking forward to your comments and reactions. Thank you so much, Darren, for the this uh, this great presentation and and this uh, this fascinating book, uh, which I think is is a really timely and and much uh, needed contribution to the AI debate and and you also alluded to the to the energy transition uh, uh, discussion at the, at the at the end of the presentation. I think that uh, the book is is also a great read. So for those who haven't read it yet, it's a great read. There's a a clear narrative that technological change is ultimately a distributional issue. And that the distribution of winners and losers is largely a political story, but there there's also a lot of illustrative cases, so so it's really worth uh, the read. Uh, I'm sure there will be many many questions on the what can we do, what should we do now. But maybe to kickstart the the discussion, I would have two relatively quick points: one on the on the future, one on the past. Uh, and on the let me start with the with the past. So um, uh, there's a few chapters of the book on the history of the industrial revolution and uh you you stop you pause on this question of why did britain why did the west kick off first and that has been a you know a topic of a, of a lot of inquiry in the social sciences since then um and what the book argues is that from the economics literature there's been a focus on technology, geography, culture, natural resources, government policy to try to explain why Britain started uh, uh, first or kicked off before the rest of the world. And then the book stresses that there's a missing part of the story here. Uh, and so I then thought that you would embrace the Pomeranz view that, uh, you know, colonies mattered so much because without the colonies, there would not have been an ecological basis for Britain to industrialize and to export whatever it had produced. But instead, and correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that, in fact, the main narrative you want to push forward is that Britain had developed a nation of entrepreneurship, right? And so I would, I'd be curious to, to hear you on, on, 
on this in particular and on this uh, ecological basis argument that's made by, by Pomerantz in, in other work. And then the second question is somewhat related, and it's how to think about the future of uh, growth, productivity gains, and the way they might be shared or not. And coming back to your initial reflections on optimism versus pessimism about technology, uh, I'd be curious to hear how you think we can use the framework you develop in the book to think about the energy transition and perhaps in particular, how to think about discourses of growth optimism when it comes to new technologies. So i.e. Uh, there's going to be a lot of efficiency gains associated to green technology versus discourses of growth pessimism. So basically, uh, we will have to use more labor. It will take more time to produce the same things as before because we're not going to pollute the world anymore. So it's going to be more costly. It's going to take more time versus maybe another way to think about this, which would be to say that in the end, the overall effect of all this on GDP growth on average productivity is not, it's, it's besides the point. And so I would like yeah, to hear you on, where you situate yourself in that and how to use the this book to think about these issues in the world where we're back potentially to a, a question of ecological boundaries. So thanks again, Darren, for this, this great book and, and this great presentation. Well, thank you, Luca, for those very encouraging comments and these excellent questions. So let me, let me answer them uh, in turn. So on the... Uh, <clears throat> on the British Industrial Revolution, of course, it's like a huge, huge, huge literature. Everything has been tried, everything has been debated, everything has been refuted. Uh, so what we emphasize, in some sense, is what was striking for us once we started thinking about these issues, and I've written about the British Industrial Revolution before, was, in some sense, the similarity between Britain at the end of the 19th century or the second half of the uh, sorry second half of the 18th century and uh the united states in the 1970s and 80s which is that there was a new group of people who were rising becoming slowly more powerful and despite the fact that you might at first think this is like a positive social mobility because they are not the established elites, they're not the industrialists, they're not uh, the, the sons and daughters of the richest people. This was a very peculiar change. In both cases, this rising, what's sometimes by historians called the middling class in the, uh, in, in the British case or the tech entrepreneurs, were very ambitious, very optimistic, and also completely silent about the hardships or the difficulties of the rest of society. And so that perspective then led us to think about what were the institutional changes, changes in the scientific ideas, changes in uh, sort of the ideologies or what we're calling the visions of people about what's the right ordered society in Britain and with with similarity in the United States around the same time. And that was sort of the analogy. And uh, and then therefore the, the emphasis that we are putting on the British Industrial Revolution is how the process of industrial uh, in the institutional change that started in, in Britain, uh, in England, and then in Britain, uh, then led to sort of the weakening of social controls that existed, which then enabled this group to both have aspirations related to technology and transforming the economy, and also the ability to carry out some of these things, which again has a lot of parallel to the way, in our minds at least, to what happened in the United States. In doing this, we didn't mean to dismiss the other interpretations or the explanations completely. What we say is that they're not sufficient and, and that's very much true in my mind about the Pomerantz interpretation. So if you look at uh, the resources that Europe gets from, uh, from the colonies, for example, some of those become important in 
the 1820s, for example, with cotton. Uh, but but for the first 50 years or so of the Industrial Revolution, they're not playing much of a role. So the the what's going on in the textile industry and the coal mining and the mechanical parts of uh, sort of building machines, for example, in Britain don't really depend on imports from uh, from the colonies so much. So so that's the sense in which we think the direct transfer of resources is not so important. Now, I think for the later phase, one part of one input is particularly important, as I also mentioned, which is cotton. So without cottons from cotton exports from the US South, things would have evolved differently. But I'm not sure how differently they would have evolved because we actually have a natural experiment, which is explored in a paper by Walker Hanlon. Uh, so the uh, American Civil War leads to a blockade. So cotton exports from the US South completely stop to Britain. But at that point, you have a very quick uh, surge in new innovations and patents that then enable the uh, uh, the British companies to use uh, Indian cotton, to some extent also Egyptian and B B uh, Brazilian cotton, but especially the Indian cotton is the one that's very different. And there is a complete technological adjustment to using Indian cotton. And so I think if you take away Indian cotton, Egyptian cotton, Brazilian cotton, and US cotton, perhaps uh, British Industrial Revolution would have had a trouble, but its dependence on any one source probably wasn't as strong as uh, as the naive Pomerantz we would suggest. In terms of the uh, 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 energy transition, 100% right, and you are the expert on this, Luca, so I'm more than happy to listen to you. But I think there are a lot of parallels between what I'm talking about in terms of a pro-worker direction of production technologies and clean tech. In both cases, the, the direction that society was going, the economy was going, wasn't the right one. In both cases, there was a redirection was necessary and that redirection was technological, but embedded in institutions and policy and civil society. So the redirection that we started having, which for example, uh, takes the form of a uh, very sharp increase in renewable technologies, many more patents, especially for solar, but also offshore and onshore wind, decline in costs, etc., would not have been possible without the technological change. But that technological change was triggered by some government policies, regulations in, that started in California, carbon pricing in a few places in Europe, subsidies to green technologies in both the US and Europe and China, but also very importantly, civil society action. So I think it is that ensemble of social changes that is very, very important. And everybody says that the green transition is the hardest political change. And I think it's a very, very hard political change. But in some sense, I actually think that what we are talking about here with the pro-worker directions of technology may be even harder. There is one thing that's actually advantageous for the energy transition. First of all, we are all on this planet. So the rich and the poor and the educated and uneducated would also suffer if there is, you know, the, de the degree to which they will suffer is different, but they will all suffer together. But second, educated people in Europe and the United States are very well aware of this and they're politically very influential and for, both for selfish and altruistic reasons, they are very committed in advancing, you know, the green agenda. There is that green agenda is now facing a lot of resistance from uh, uh, from some corporate interests, oil companies, etc. But I think the influential, educated elite is now on board with the green agenda. I think they are still not on board with a more pro-worker direction of technology. So I actually see, in some sense, perhaps what I'm talking about in this book, even harder than the green transition, but people may disagree on that. Thanks so much, Darren. In the interest of a, a broader discussion, I think we should open the floor to uh, to other people. Thomas, maybe? Yeah, well, very quickly, and maybe then Alice, if you want to gather some questions from the audience, I, I don't know. I, let, let me... Uh, go and continue on the discussion about the perspective. So 
if we want to make, you know, to redirect technical change in a more pro uh, worker uh, uh, fashion, so what, you know, what are your favorite tools? So in, so if we think of, you know, strengthening uh, labor power, union power, so do you think giving more voice to worker representative in the board of companies, you know, can be one way to, to make them uh, more powerful? Is this something that you favor? And, and on the tax dimension, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, reducing labor taxation, so cutting payroll tax in particular. But then, yeah, my concern is, okay, it's, it's good to cut payroll tax uh, completely, but then uh, what are you going to replace it with exactly? And uh, are you sure the masks are going to work? And are you sure you're going to have some money left for... Uh, you know, educational investment, because when you, when, when you look, you know, when I look at your graph on rising inequality by, by educational level, and, and uh, when I look at the, the slowdown of productivity growth over recent decades, it seems to me that, you know, the most obvious explanation is the stagnation of total, uh, in particular, public education investment, you know, which historically has increased from less than 1% of national income uh, one century ago to six, seven percent of national income today, but then it has sort of stagnated since the 1980s, 1990s uh, in the US, in Western Europe, in Japan, pretty much everywhere, um, you know, because of the stagnation of total public spending in, in general. And, and, and uh, so, you know, that will, you know, one way to sort of reinvest in human capital and give, give human worker more, more uh, importance would be to, to, start again with this historical trend toward more investment in education, but then you also need to pay for it. So if you get rid of payroll tax, how do you make all this work together? Thank you, Thomas. So uh, let me first, uh, let, let me make three points. Those are excellent questions. First, uh, in the book, we have a number of uh, policy ideas, but they're all embryonic. We're not committed to all of them. And no, we haven't done the full maths and, uh, and because they are sort of still uh in the form of basic proposals uh but but it's very encouraging right now because exactly like there was a uh, uh tipping point in the in energy case where from this being in the back burner of people's minds suddenly it became an important issue for civil society activity for employees putting pressures on their company again luca can tell us much more about that but we're we're seeing that in the us you know, about a year ago, when people were talking about AI, the last thing that anybody would have thought is to give labor a voice. Today, uh, you know, there is a complete shift, both in the labor movement, with whom I'm talking a lot, and also among Democratic and some Republican politicians that they say, okay, labor has to be at the table when these things are decided. So yes, that's a very, very important part of it. And, and perhaps, you know, in an incredible fashion, it's actually perhaps... A, reality, a possibility in the United States. The second point about taxes, 100%, Toma. So uh, in a paper with Pascual Restrepo and Andrea Manera, uh, we did some more digging on this. And, and our conclusion was in the United States, and the same is you know, not as exaggerated, but true in several other industrialized nations, uh, it seems, is capitalists, especially equipment and digital capitalists, so lightly taxed relative to labor that it creates an artificial incentive to automate. So in the United States, if you hire a worker, the worker and the firm together pay about 30% tax, including uh, uh, including uh, employee benefits and healthcare expenditures. Even if you value healthcare expenditures at a very high rate, that goes down to 25%. If you do the same thing, to do the same tasks with capital, you pay a 5% tax. So our solution to that is to increase corporate income taxes and get rid of many of the deductions. A lot of this, by the way, is because of hugely uh, generous tax breaks that people get when they invest. So if you get rid of those tax breaks, you actually expand the tax base for capital income without increasing the marginal rate but you would increase the average marginal rate to for you know uh because you're you're bringing more of the capital into the taxation that's going to increase to something like 15% some somewhere between 10 and 15%. Now on top of it I think we also need to increase 
marginal taxes on capital. And I my my preferred thing for that would be uh, in the form of corporate income taxes. In terms of education, actually, you'll see that there is there's a much more skeptical ideas about education in the book. And there's a reason for that. So I completely agree with you that training is critical. But I think economists' discussion of education has not been satisfactory. And uh, we, we say this a little bit, but we don't get too much into the, too much of the details. But here is the reason why I think economists' discussion of education has not been completely satisfactory, which is that essentially a lot of economists have the following view, which is, you know, technology has to go wherever it will go, either the nature of science or the genius of tech entrepreneurs is going to determine the future of technology. And then we need to invest more and more in higher education in order to make up for it, to create a workforce that's able to use those technologies. That hasn't worked and it's not the right perspective. First of all, as I have argued, the direction of technology is not predetermined. We need to choose it. And we need to choose it in a way that's best suited to our social, economic, and educational preconditions. And I don't think the idea that we should send everybody to college is the right perspective. You know, that's why I emphasize in the book uh, and in this talk, things like electricians, plumbers, uh, manual workers. If you look at the issue in the United States, again, I know Europe a little less well, but is these workers, there's actually a shortage of these workers and we're not training them. And you're not going to do that by sending them to uh, colleges. So I think we need to have the right technology for them and the right way of training them, which is very different than I think the perspective we need to invest more and more in higher education. In fact, I think this emphasis on higher and higher education has been symbiotic with this with the other aspect of the problem, which is let technology go in a more and more skill biased direction and we don't care about it. And I think both of those are symbiotic and the right way is to redirect technological change in a more pro-worker direction and then prepare the workers better given their occupations, given their skills, given their rich set of perspectives to work better with the technologies that are right for their comparative advantage. But yes, absolutely. Training of that sort is very crucial, but that's not where we're spending a lot of money. And that's not actually very expensive. Training electricians, plumbers, uh, you know, maintenance workers, that's not actually very expensive compared to, you know, four-year college. All right. So there are about seven questions in the, in the chat. So I'm not going to read them all because otherwise uh, it will be, uh, we won't have enough time for your answer. Maybe I'll just uh, pick like three of them. Please, yes, Alice, and, that would be great. Uh, yeah. So just uh, so like elaborating more about the labor movement, there was a question about the, the or more comment leading to a question about the, the power of unions, which seem to have eroded dramatically over the past four decades. And could you, there's someone asking, could you explain why in a nutshell, and maybe more share your views uh, on how to rebalance power relations between workers and capital owners? Perfect. And there was this, let uh, let uh, me answer that one, Alice, because I think that's such an important question. Let me jump onto that. And I was, I did not answer it in response to Thomas' question. I thought of doing it, but I didn't want to take time from, uh, so it's actually super important because first of all, labor's power is institutional but it also depends on what the labor movement is doing. And I think the labor movement hasn't really been very active. And there are institutional reasons for why the labor movement is weak in the United States. You know, for instance, labor law, at least as interpreted, says bargaining has to be at the establishment level, which makes it very hard for unions to get engaged with big companies and also negotiate on technologies. But I think what is now shifting, again, this is just like over the last year, the labor movement is actually sort of understanding the importance of getting engaged in technology. And that's actually very crucial. So let me, to illustrate that, let me do the following thought experiment. Imagine that you have a very strong union. We are in an environment like in the United States where there are plenty of automation technologies. And what the union does is that it increases its pay demand. What that will do is that it will actually just encourage even more automation because firms are going to say, well, we have these automation technologies, labor has become more expensive, labor has become more troublesome, let's automate even more. So the key for the labor movement is 
to move from the right to manage bargaining to a broader bargaining where technology is at the center of their bargain. And that's what we saw with the WGA. To some extent, that's what we saw with the UWA's recent deal, although I think there are more problems in that one. So, and that's what where the labor movement is shifting, whether it will be effective, what the resistance from companies will be, I don't know, but I think it's an amazing transformation that's possible. I'm not sure whether it's going to be a reality, but it's possible. And if it happens, I think despite those institutional barriers, there could be a renewal of labor movement, but doing it centered on technology is key. Um, so an another question, maybe on something that we haven't uh, discussed so far about current discussion about regulation, uh, uh, artificial intelligence regulation and open source, and especially like last week, for example, there there was a summit organized by Rishi Sunak. So this is still something happening right now. Um, can you share your views on that? Yeah, absolutely. Regulation is key, and uh, some of the other ideas in the book about uh, the tech direction is about regulation. So for example, if you, I did not get into these issues of why centralization of information is so problematic, but when you look at the details, a lot of it is based on the monetization model, how companies use the information and and that creates really systemic problems. For example, you know, uh, using using that information to be monetized via digital ads, which then creates a particular set of incentives for data collection, a particular set of incentives about how you present that data and uh, and how you compete against uh, uh, against rivals and so on and so forth. So one of the ideas we suggest is, for example, digital ad taxes, which we think will, uh, will open up the business environment. But even more importantly, uh, on the regulation side, we suggest that the need for data unions or collective data ownership, which means that you're actually not going to be able to use data, especially from creative artists or previous uh, accumulated knowledge, including Wikipedia, including, you know, books and uh, entertainment and so on. And that cannot be based on individual ownership. It has to be based on collective ownership. There are interesting reasons for that, but let me not get into it. But that requires a complete set of regulation. But just like digital ad taxes, data ownership are very important, not just for who makes profits at the moment, but for the direction of technology. The, the current environment in which data is owned by you know data is expropriated by the large digital platforms really creates more of a bias towards uh uh towards exploitative uses of data and centralization of information but let me say on open source that's actually much much less clear so if the problem is the direction of technology and we're getting the wrong direction of technology just encouraging open source so that you get more innovation in the same direction wouldn't be a solution so that's why I think a lot of the emphasis in my mind has to be on the direction of innovation. If you don't fix the direction of innovation and you put more money or you encourage more entrance, that might actually make things worse. So, so that's why the emphasis of what are we getting from these technologies? What are we getting from these new market structures has to be key. And I guess this will have to be the and word because it's almost six and we promised to, uh, sorry, six o'clock in Paris. <laughs> so, and we promised that we'll finish on time. Um, we'll record the questions that you asked somewhere and we'll see how we can address them. Uh, in any case, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Diana Semoglu. Thank you all, to all the speakers. Uh, maybe you, just Darren. a quick note. For those who are in Paris, because we have another equality debate this week on Thursday, this time it's in person at Paris School of Economics, and we'll receive researchers, author, and illustrator who've been working on a great graphic novel uh, about how um, we can install democracy in the workplace. So I really invite you all uh, um, this coming uh, Thursday, and hopefully we'll also have members of Parliament, François Ruffin, with us. So uh, once again, thank you everyone. I'll pop the link to register to our next equality debate in the chat so that you can all have it, click on it before we close this um, this session. And um, thank you, merci beaucoup. Yeah. Thanks, a lot. You Thanks a lot, Darren.
Sense thank you, Tuma, and thank you, Alice. This was great to be able to be part of the equality debates. And uh, for, thank you for the fantastic questions from Luca and Tomas, and as well as from the audience.